towards the turn of the previous century. He was known for his acrobatics. He was a baseball player, and he walked off the baseball diamond and decided to give his heart to Jesus and be a preacher. And uh, he had a lot of different sayings that's quoted today. One of the sayings is, he would say in the middle of his preaching, he'd say, now, if, if I'm rubbing your cat the wrong way, turn the cat around. <laughs> I think that was his colloquialism for saying, you know, if, if the preaching of the Word of God challenges you, then maybe you need to adopt a, an attitude that maybe I need some more of this. Yeah. <laughs> You know, if, if you only go to church and hear the things you've always heard and never hear anything new. Now, I'm not talking about something that's not in here. <laughs> it's got to come out of here yeah. or it don't count. But as long as it's coming out of the Bible, if, if you never hear anything new, you're not growing. And sometimes you may say, boy, I didn't know that was in there. Or you may say... That's not exactly what I wanted to hear today. <laughs> and yet, that's how we grow. By the milk of the word and by the meat of the word. Yeah. Well, we'll be in uh, Exodus chapter number 35. Got some people out traveling need to pray for. Got some sick folks need to pray for. Good to have... Uh, the Russ Camp's back with us. They went over to Moralton uh, this morning. They were backslidden. And, no, I'm just teasing. They, uh, Brother, <laughs> Brother Russ Camp was preaching for Larry Black over at Moralton Baptist Temple. Uh, Brother Black had, uh, he'd been having some eye trouble, uh, lost vision in one of his eyes. And I kind of know how, how that is. I lost mine about 14 years ago and uh, still not completely used to it. And so he had just got back from Mayo Clinic, uh, I guess up in Minnesota, and uh, he didn't know if he'd be able to preach today or not. And so uh, he, I'd been in contact with him, and he asked if we could, either one of us, me or Aaron or somebody in our church could come and preach for him. And so uh, since I'm lazy, I volunteered Brother Russ Camp. <laughs> and uh, I think they had a good, good day in the house of the Lord in Moralton. We'll read uh, in Exodus chapter 35, beginning at verse number 4. We'll just read two verses for the start. We see here the beginning of something brand new, a house of worship for the Israelites. They're in the wilderness. They need a house of worship to be able to travel with them as they go through their wilderness journeys. And so in verse 4, we take up there with Moses Speaking, and it says, And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. And then if you'll look on down to verse number 20, they're taking up an offering for the building of that house of worship. And verse number 20, it says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and there came everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, and as many were, uh, were willing-hearted and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets and all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought 
onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and spice and oil for the light and the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of the work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd stir our hearts about the the things of God. I pray that you'd bless us, increase our learning. Help us, Lord, just to have hearts that are stirred up for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we was talking about having a a heart on fire for God. And so then when your heart's on fire for God, then when the burning fiery furnace approaches you, you'll, you'll have a heart that's already on fire and you won't mind just going ahead and doing what God said to do. Just stand. And here we find a different kind of, of a heart that's willing and a heart that's stirred. We're going to talk tonight about building the house of God. Building the house of God. And we'll use... Exodus 35, and before we quit, we'll jump over for one verse out of chapter 39. <laughs> in 2001, along about that time, we talked about it before and after, but along about that time, we set out to build a new auditorium uh, on this property. We bought this property and, and got the building uh, underway as far as the loan goes and all, and so we, <laughs> we wanted to be able to reach this community. We felt as Liberty Baptist Church, we, we need to reach the community for Christ. Now we believe in missions, we believe in sending missionaries around the world and giving to missions and praying for missions and to see people saved of, of every color and stripe, every background, every ethnicity. Everybody needs to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, <clears throat> our purpose here in Searcy uh, was not only to be able to send out missionaries to other people, but our purpose was focused here as far as our soul winning and our witnessing goes here in Searcy to reach the people that I know and you know and we want to see them get saved. We want to see them not only get saved but we wanted a building where we could meet together and the saints of God could be equipped. You know a church meeting is primarily for the equipping of the saints. You knew that, didn't you? I mean, we think of it sometimes as just a big revival meeting 365 days a year and we want the gospel to go out every service. I try not to end any service without giving an invitation for somebody to receive the Lord as Savior. But the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 talks about pastors and teachers and, and talking about making people able and equipped to do the work of God. And I'm just going to slip my coat off. It's, it's hot outside. I mean, it's cool in here, but since I know it's hot outside, it makes me feel hot in here. <laughs> so we wanted to reach people in Searcy, Arkansas, so we built a building. We didn't build a building to be a beautiful edifice so people drive by and say, man, isn't that a pretty place? Well, it's not that big and it's not that pretty, but it is a place to worship. And I don't suppose that tabernacle, is, as glorious as it might sound in the, in the Bible, that tabernacle might not have been all that pretty either. I mean, it's got goat skins on it. <laughs> you ever seen goat skin? You ever seen? You ever smelled a, a goat? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not so sure. And badger skins and and all sorts of stuff. Now it was sufficient, and they had a lot of valuable items given to furnish that tabernacle, and it served the purpose. It was a place where people could worship the Lord, and that's what we wanted this for: is a place for people to worship the Lord and to be equipped. And primarily, we're not in here tonight to tell everybody how to get saved. I suspect most of you are saved. Sometimes we have visitors and they need to hear the gospel. And so we certainly tie that in. Sometimes people are watching on the internet and they, they may not watch every time, but if they watch just once, that one time is enough to give out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ so that they hear it at least that one time. But basically we're here to be equipped to serve God. And we needed this building. We needed this property. And uh, we, did, we built a building. Some of you participated. And some of you that were here back then are still here. And some of you have come on in later years and some have come recently. And we're glad everybody's here. But <clears throat> what we did when we built this thing, we were poor as my dad used to say, we were poor as Job's turkey. And we didn't have any money. We raised enough money to get a down payment to 
buy the property. And we got a we got a bargain on the property. I mean, we got we got 14 acres for seventy-two thousand dollars, and that was already a bargain. And I asked the the seller, I said, you know, I feel like the Lord wants us to have this for for seventy-two thousand instead of seventy-five. And he kind of looked at me funny. He said, Well, I hadn't thought about that. He was a Christian. He said, Okay, we'll we'll make it seventy-two. <laughs> so I, I should have asked him for ten more thousand, you know. <laughs> And so uh, that was a lot of money for us. I mean, we're a handful of people, no money in their pockets. We were, we were all broke. We were just giving what we could and asking other churches kind of help us out a little bit. And so we were able to buy the property, got a loan for this building, and got the building put up with a lot of volunteer help. Nearly everything was volunteer. And uh, so we've got it done. We've been paying on this thing now for all those years since then. And... It's kind of hamstrung us where there are more ministry opportunities that we could carry out if we weren't making twelve to $1,300 payments every month on this property. And so I had mentioned a while back that this was, I think, back during April, and I didn't want to just come across with too much to overwhelm people at the time, but <clears throat> during our April missions month, is that crickets? <laughs> Just as long as you don't snore, okay? Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we got the loan, we got the building up, and, but now we've been making payments on it ever since. We could do a lot more to reach out into the community, to put on more missionaries. We could do a lot more if we had that payment gone. We got it paid down a long, long ways, but man, we don't want to take another 20 years to do this. We need, we need to go ahead and extend our ministry opportunities to reach more people for the Lord Jesus. One of these days, I'll be dead. You will too. We won't have any more opportunities as far as we go to reach people for Jesus. People are dying and they are going to hell. And whether we like to think about that or talk about that, it's just the truth. We have a limited amount of time in our lifetime, my lifetime and your lifetime, to do whatever we're going to do on this earth for the cause of Christ. And so that means we've got to be busy about trying to get people under the blood of Jesus. We have to get the gospel out. No matter how we do it, we've got to spread out and get more ministry going. If we had that monthly payment for operation of the ministry, how much more? Would we be able to do? How many more souls could we reach? We, uh, I didn't want to say a lot about the, uh, the debt retirement back in April because we were focusing on missions at the time. And, and you're doing very good giving to missions. I appreciate that. I think God's pleased with us supporting the number of missionaries we do. <laughs> but there's some people that got on board right away and started giving to the retirement of the building and property debt. And we made a a fairly large payment a month ago and trimmed it way down. We paid uh, a lot of it, went towards interest. I mean, it was towards principal instead of interest. And we made a lot of progress, visible progress in that that first month. But I think it needs to be more of an organized attempt to get this property paid off. And so this is what I want to share with you tonight. I want you to know that what I'm talking about is a biblical principle. In fact, there's four principles that we can draw from the life of Moses tonight that I believe will support what we're trying to do with paying off this building debt. In verses 4 and 5, I want you to notice, first of all, it was a time of challenge. They needed a house to worship God in. And God said, you folks folks need a house to worship. You've got to have a house to worship. Here's how you're going to do it. And so he spoke to Moses, and Moses spake to the congregation, it says in verse number 4. He spake unto them, all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. An offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. Moses came to the people and he said, I've got a message from God. I believe God thoroughly wants us to finance a house of worship. And so God speaks, or God speaks through Moses. Moses speaks to the people. And uh, this was, a, this was a, a big event in the, 
in the life of Israel. Never before had they had a house of worship. But now they have that opportunity. But it doesn't come easy. And it's going to take some involvement. And God says, I, I want you to tell the folks, Moses, I want them to be involved in this. Now, he's, he's opened up the Red Sea, had he not, when they came out of Egypt. He has opened up the Red Sea for them. He brought water out of the rock for them. He's given them manna from heaven. He supplied miraculously their needs. Couldn't he have supplied miraculously that tabernacle? He could have. But you know what? <clears throat> it's kind of like raising kids. I said we're going to start a series on, on uh, child rearing. Grandma was right after all. We're going to start that in a week or two. And we're going to get down to some serious business about what, how God instructs us to raise children. Our country is going to hell in a handbasket. And I believe thoroughly that poor parenting is the number one reason. That's why we have some thugs and that's why we have some Marxists and that's, why, that's how we have people who murder and kill and rob and rape because they have no morality and parents are not training their kids in a proper way. Well, that's a story for another sermon. So, but what I'm saying is that God has a plan for us and our job is to follow His plan. God could have brought down that miraculous tabernacle from heaven but he chose to have them to participate. Because just like you hand kids everything on a silver platter, will they appreciate it as much if, as if they had worked for it? Of course not. You do your, your kids a disservice by giving them everything. Hey, I'm all in favor of making sure your kids' needs are met, but don't just hand them everything and let them sit and play games on their computer or on their uh, cell phone all the time and they don't do anything to contribute to the family. <laughs> yeah. You know how much allowance I got when I was growing up? I got gravy and biscuits in the morning. I got a bologna sandwich for lunch <laughs> and I got beans and cornbread for supper and I got a bed to sleep in that night and I got to help dad cut firewood and take care of chickens and cattle as a side benefit. <laughs> That was my allowance. I figured it must be a valuable allowance because I was allowed to live there and eat there and sleep there. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to give your kids money. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm saying that when it comes to this thing of the house of God, that we appreciate it, we love it, we feel more attached to it, we have an allegiance to the Lord when we participate in the things of God, when we're part of it, when we... When we give ourselves into it, when we put our labor into it, when we put our gold into it, when we make it our objective to make the house of God work, I think we appreciate it more. So there was a challenge. Moses gave the people a challenge. He said, we're going to have a house of worship because God says so, and this is how God says we're going to do it. So he challenged them. Now, number two, there was a time of consecration. A time of consecration. It says that the giving was from a willing heart. Look at 30, chapter 35, verse 5. Said, well, this is going to be biblical, right? You believe that? You believe the Bible? Yeah. You believe what it says about money too? Yeah. <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> well, in chapter 35, verse 5, it says, Take ye from among you an offering. Now, we could pull out a six-gun and say, All right, buddy. <laughs> Get that bill fold out, Buster. You're giving right now. Would you call that a willing heart? <laughs> I don't think so. And somebody might give just to keep from getting shot, but I don't think they'd love it. <laughs> you know what is required here and what's given here? A consecrated heart. There was a time of consecration. They were giving from a willing heart. Heart. In verses 21 and 22 it says, And they came, everyone, watch this, whose heart stirred him up. See that word stirred? I mean, that's kind of like a fire in your heart. Moses said, we're going to build a house of worship. And some people, some of the people said, Man, I'm stirred up about this. I want to give to the building fund. I want to help pay this thing off. I want to see a house of worship. Their hearts were stirred. And it says, And everyone whom his spirit made willing. Well, that, that uh, kind of sets aside the need for a sick gun <laughs> whose heart was willing. 
If you've got people willing, then there's no co coercion. Coercion doesn't work very good. <laughs> it takes a willing heart. It's even that way with raising your kids. If you can teach them to love you, if you win their heart, then you can win their obedience a lot easier than you can through just coercion alone. Well, the same thing. We're all that way. It says, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garments. Now watch verse 22. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted. Are you, are you getting that? Willing-hearted? Hearts are stirred. Spirit is stirred. These people were enthusiastic. They're saying, man, let us in on it. We're all for it. Give us a chance to give. And boy, did they ever. It says, and they brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, and all jewels of gold, and every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. So how do we understand this response from those Israelites? Well, their spirits were stirred. Their hearts were stirred. Man, they were, they were enthusiastic. There must have been some kind of movement on the inside. Isn't that true? Their heart was stirred. The heart means the inner man. The spirit means the inner man. They were stirred on the inside. They didn't just give out of emotion. They didn't give out of, out of just duty. They didn't just give out of coercion. Their hearts were stirred. They were in this. <laughs> I guess you could say they had a joyous enthusiasm, sharing in this exciting project that has just begun. <laughs> we, need, we need to have a willing heart. It's kind of tough, but there's times when even an old curmudgeon, an old stingy gut, man, his heart will get stirred on the inside for God, and he'll do things that he wouldn't have thought he would ever done for the Lord. And then there's some that don't change. I heard the story about the pastor who got onto his song leader. He was he was, going, he was preaching a stewardship sermon about giving. And, <clears throat> and after service was over, he went and got on to his song leader. He said, when I'm preaching a, a service about stewardship and giving, don't ever lead the service off with Jesus paid it all. <laughs> does, God, does God's grace stir our hearts? If so, we have a great an awesome privilege to be involved in doing something like these Israelites did. Even in our day, an eager and highly motivated and consecrated congregation in a local church can accomplish things that only God can see them through. <laughs> over and over we read that what was given was given willingly. Given willingly. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 10 and 11, Paul said, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do so, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness of will. Did you get to catch that phrase? A readiness of will. These people, it wasn't that, you know, the preacher wasn't getting up and, and he wasn't pinching them. He wasn't poking them. He wasn't stabbing them. He wasn't guilt tripping them. He said, not, Paul said, you, you folks had a readiness, a willingness to give even a year ago. So let's, let's do it. Let's do it. And they did. <laughs> he said, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. There was a, an eager willingness. And notice also in our text in chapter 35 of Exodus there was, the giving was widespread in participation let me say that again <laughs> the, the giving was widespread in participation oh we've had three or four people in our congregation that's already told me they're excited about getting this building and property paid off but but it's a lot easier, a lot more effective if it's widespread. It takes the burden off of those who are willing to give above and beyond and to distribute it out more evenly. It says in verse number 21 of our chapter 35 in Exodus, and they came 
Everyone. Boy, that sounds like widespread giving, doesn't it? Every one of them wanted in on it. In chapter 35, and verse 22, it says, both men and women, and they came, both men and women. Man, they were, they were all excited about it. It was widespread giving. And in verse 27, it says, and the rulers brought. I mean, their leadership said, we, we're not just telling somebody else to do it, we're going to give too. And so the rulers brought. And then in verse 29, it says, the children of Israel brought. Man, this is everybody. The children of Israel. That just got them all. And it, all of them were bringing whatever they could. They had an enthusiasm. They wanted to see this house of worship. They wanted to see it built and finished for the glory of God. Well, it looks like everybody's bringing gifts. and Their stirred hearts were spurring them on to do that. And everybody said... <laughs> yeah, yeah. the words all and every it just appears in connection with the response of all these people all people, every person it was, the response of the people was just overwhelming I mean man they were just getting in on it overwhelming in terms of the number of people involved and then the giving was wonderfully abundant not only was it widespread everybody's involved but it was abundant I mean they wasn't just counting out a few pennies there. It says that in verse number 23, And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red, red skins of rams and badger skins brought of them. Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was found shittim wood uh, for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and fine linen. And so they're spinning goat's hair and they're spinning linen. Ben, everybody's getting in on it. And they're not just bringing a little, but they're bringing it abundantly. Man, it sounds like they brought the oil for the incense and all of that. They're, they're just going on. It's an abundant thing. The response of people to Moses' challenge it's just overwhelming. Not like Bubba, the man who, uh, <laughs> who had uh, something of value. There's just a couple of guys, a couple of country boys. And, and uh, Jake says to Bubba, he said, Bubba, if you had a million dollars, do you like me enough that you'd give me half of it? Why, he said, well, Jake, or Bubba, of course I would. He said, I'd, I'd give you half of my million dollars, no problem. He said, well, if you had $1,000, would you give me half of that? He said, well, you know, we're good buddies, we're friends. I'd give you 500 of that 1,000. I'd split it with you right down the middle. And so then... Jake said, well, Bubba, if you had two hogs, would you give me one of them? He said, now, wait a minute. You know I've got two hogs. <laughs> Aren't we that way? <laughs> well, you know, somebody says to the church, I've had people tell me this over the years, if I ever win the lottery preacher, I'm going to give half of it to the church. And I'm wondering, what would half of what you've got right now be? <laughs> you know, chances are we're not going to win the lottery. You ain't got no business playing it anyway. Right? <laughs> so we're willing to give that which we don't have, but what about giving from what we do have? Well, the people here responded in three ways. They gave and they served and they obeyed the Lord. The people gave of their resources for the construction of that tabernacle. Everybody in Israel is given the privilege of giving material resources with which they had personally been blessed. God's still in the business of building his household, the church. He's still doing that. Just because we live in the New Testament doesn't mean that he's done with the house of worship. Doesn't mean he's finished with people being involved in the house of God. He wants us to be involved. He's adding to his family. Boy, I'm, I am thrilled. I hope you are. I'm thrilled with the people that have come to this church in the past year. Man, we've had young families coming. 
with kids. And finally, Aaron and Erica got on board, and they're going to supply us with another kid. So we, I mean, there's more than one way to grow a church. <laughs> we've had young couples coming. We've got single parents coming. We've got, we've got middle-aged people coming. And, uh, and you single people, I have some names on the list. I'm, I'm about to start getting some of you married off. If you, need, if you need some help, just let me know. <laughs> yeah, everybody turn around looking at somebody. <laughs> Who's he talking about? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we need all the help we can get building the house of the Lord. The household of God needs more people. And with more babies we have, the bigger the congregation will grow. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled about all the young families that come, the middle-aged people, and, and the older people. Miss Velma Sutton. Her husband Earl, you know, she would have been here today along with her daughter and her dad. I mean, her husband. <laughs> if she hadn't broke her hip, you talk about faithfulness. She's a faithful lady. I hope her hip, hip gets healed up. But we've got we've got older folks, we've got middle aged folks, and then we've got we've got semi young folks like J T. Dewitt and Helen. And, and some of the others that have come. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad God's brought them our way. God's building up his household of faith. Glad for Gabe back there. Drives all, you still live in Hebrew, right? He drives all the way from Hebrew over here to go to church. And, and I'm, I'm glad about everybody that God's brought together. But, but what would it be like if we had more coming in? What if we had, what if we had to, we got this thing paid off. What if we had to build a bigger auditorium? What if we were getting more people saved, more people baptized, and the congregation was growing, and there was more people sitting in here needing to be equipped, more people needing to learn how to witness for the Lord, more people inviting folks to come to church, more people giving in the offerings, more people learning how to serve God and to stand faithfully. Wouldn't that be something? Amen. And so that's what we're trying to do is to be able to expand ministry. All of this takes resources. And if we're not giving, we're not serving, we're not obeying, it may be because we fear loss if we do. But it's always been God's way for people to give and sacrifice. Always been God's way. Remember David, the king? He was getting ready to give an offering for the Lord and, 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 the, and the farmer was going to donate his uh, oxen and so forth for the offering. David said, no, sir. I'm not going to take anything for nothing to dedicate to the Lord. I'm going to pay for it. He was willing to. I mean, he could have took the uh, free offering, but he said, no, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to give something that's worthless to the Lord. It's always been God's way for us to give and to sacrifice. And number three, after there was a challenge, and then there was, there was this consecration where people said, you know, I can do something. I can do something. Something. God is my helper. I can do something. Then thirdly, there was a time of consideration. Verse 20 of our text, chapter 35 of Exodus. A time of consideration. And all the congregation of the children of Moses, or the children of Israel, departed from the presence of Moses. It's remarkable that nothing is said about immediate reception of those offerings. I mean, if people started flooding the offering boxes tonight, I mean, we wouldn't protest. <laughs> but nothing said here that, that they all just gave right on the spot. There was time for consideration. It says the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. You know what they did? They went home and thought this thing over. You know, what old Moses, what that preacher said, you know. Let's think about that. Let's get the family together and let's pray about that. Because God, if God thinks it's a good idea, I think we better pray about it. See if we can get involved some way. <clears throat> Nothing said of immediate reception. Quietly, gradually, orderly. Those people filed out after they heard Moses' message. And they went back to their tents. Now, I don't know what it was like in their tents that night. The Bible doesn't say. We don't know. But we can just imagine maybe a little bit that maybe in... This tent over here, maybe they're gathered around uh, the fire. Maybe they're at the fire at the tent door, and maybe they're praying. You know, what what could we do? Could we give some goat's hair? Could we spend some fine linen? What could we do? Let's pray. See what God 
instructs us to do. We want to be involved. We're, we're excited about it. <clears throat> Not made on the spur of the moment. They, they thought this over. It's worth considering. They said, let's think about this. So they went home, considered it. First, they, they probably reflected on how God had miraculously delivered them from Egypt. Do you remember how God delivered you from sin? Do you remember when God saved your soul and suddenly you realized, hey, I don't have to go to hell anymore. Man, hallelujah, I'm saved and I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to do anything, period. God just saved me. There's nothing left for me to do. I get to go to heaven. I'm not bound for hell. Boy, God's treated me pretty good. Maybe, maybe they were thinking about that. Maybe they're thinking about how they got delivered from slavery in Egypt. Second, they, maybe they remembered how they had been out in the wilderness and they were hungry and God had given them manna from heaven. No, it wasn't T-bone steak, it was manna. <laughs> but they lived on it. You see, when God makes something like the manna, it's, it's fully nourishing. It might not taste like T-bone, but it'll nourish better than T-bone. And... That maybe they're thinking about that in their tents. You know, they're thinking, boy, God has done a lot for us. You know, we were out there and we were thirsty. And God provided for us. Man, we were hungry. And even though we were whining and belly aching, God sent us some quail. And we had fried quail and mashed potatoes for supper. I don't know about the mashed potatoes. <laughs> they're probably sitting around thinking, you know, boy, God's been good to us. And maybe, maybe finally they were realizing how God had just blessed them and maybe they looked around their tent and, and they said, you know, we don't have a big tent. We don't have a lot of expensive stuff, but everything that's in here, God gave it to us. Everything we own, he gave it to us. Maybe they're thinking about all those things. And then... After this time of consideration, there was a time of completion. Chapter 39 and verse 43. We'll go over to that chapter. I said we would in just a little bit. Chapter 39, verse 43. <clears throat> you know, they, they finally came to the place where they finished what God gave them to do. So you think we'll ever get this place pay, paid off? Yeah, I believe we will. With God helping us, I believe we will. Chapter 39, verse 43, And Moses did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. You know, something satisfying, just knowing you've done something that pleases the Lord. Don't you agree with that? Amen. There's something satisfying to the soul when you know you've been pleasing to the Lord. He, it says, And they had done it as the Lord commanded, even so they done it, and Moses blessed them. Moses, it says in verse 43, did look upon all the work. And the, the sense of that word, did look, the sense of that verb is the same. It's the same sense of the word in Genesis when God created creation to begin with. It says God saw that everything he'd created was what? Good. <laughs> Moses looked around and kind of saying the same thing that God said. Man, we depended on God. God challenged us. We considered it. We got consecrated. We followed the Lord. We were obedient to Him. Now the house of the Lord is finished. We brought the stuff. We got it done. Boy, it's done. There's a sense of satisfaction. And Moses looked around and he said, Man, this looks good. <laughs> I think our building looks good. It's, it's not the Sistine Chapel. It's Liberty Baptist Church. But how nice does it have to be to be nice? I mean, you know how hot it is outside right now? It's hot and steamy. I hear and feel the air conditioners running. Do you know that the seats we sat on was probably, would probably be a lot more comfortable than the rocks that they sat on out there in that wilderness as they wandered in the wilderness? I think these seats are more comfortable than those rocks, don't you? I mean, we've got bathrooms inside. You know what they had to do? They had to carry a shovel around with them in those days, dig a hole. They didn't even have an outhouse. I'm serious. 
You can read about it in Deuteronomy. They were, they were commanded to carry a, a paddle to dig a hole and then cover it up. We got bathrooms inside and coffee. <laughs> God's been good. He's been real good to us. I would like for us to be able to pay this thing off, for everybody to be involved. And when, when it's all done, we, could, we can look around like Moses did and say, boy, it's finished. In fact, I think we'll build, a, we'll build a fire out back. We'll burn a brush pile and take the, the bank note and burn it with everybody here. And we'll, we'll burn that bank note and then sing around the campfire. Victory in Jesus. <laughs> Amazing grace. And yes, he paid it all. I'd like for us to be able to do that. Will you join the ranks of the faithful like these in Exodus? And let's see if we can do that. This is practical, but it has a purpose. It has a purpose of being able to minister more fully and more widely to receive souls into the kingdom of God. When we pay off this building, we can do so much more to reach souls. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us as we attempt with your help to pay off this property, pay off this building. Lord, I pray that every soul under my hearing, the hearing of this message tonight, would seriously contemplate during the week to come Lord, would you have me to be involved? Lord, I'd like to be involved. All those people out there in the wilderness seem like every one of them wanted to be involved and in bringing things for the house of God to see that it was finished, a place of worship. And Lord, I'd like to be just as enthusiastic as they. Lord, I pray you'd help me to find your will in how I can be used to accomplish this great task so that, Lord, we can reach more souls to bring you glory. Father, bless us. Help us to be contemplative as we consider our role in this great feat. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Would you stand with me to our feet?